welcome first and foremost everyone to tonight's training. We are so glad that you can join us. And given that tonight is actually the inaugural training that we're also inviting all of our summer 2020 cohort for the Climate Advocate Training Program with, I'd love to introduce Clara Fang, CCL Student Engagement Coordinator, to then introduce and welcome everyone that's a part of that program that's running us tonight. So Clara has been in volunteering with CCL in 2016 and now serves as Student Engagement Coordinator. And in that role, she engages students in climate advocacy and helps members conduct outreach to higher education. She's got 15 years of experience implementing sustainability in higher ed with masters in uh, environmental management from Yale and an MFA in creative writing from the University of Utah. She's also a doctoral student currently in environmental studies at Antioch. So feel free to take it from here, Clara, and welcome everyone to tonight's training. Thank you so much, Brett. It's great to see everyone. I really want to welcome you all to the summer 2020 Climate Advocate Training Program. And this is our first core volunteer training in the series. So we are really excited to have you join us for the summer. Uh, it's been a, a challenging spring and we really see this as an opportunity for students and anyone else who wants to join us to become a better climate advocate um, and to join CCL in our efforts to fight climate change. So students and the participants in this program, um, they will go to CCL's virtual conference, which is happening June 13th. You can join your local chapter to attend a lobby meeting in your district, um, participate actively in at least nine sessions of the core volunteer trainings and post in the program's discussion forum. Have one call with a regional fellow or myself to discuss your further involvement if you like to. Uh, write and submit a letter to the ed editor or op-ed to your preferred media outlet. So at the end of the summer, um, if you have completed all of these things, then you'll be able to join our campus leaders program to start a climate campaign or a CCL chapter at your school in the fall. Um, so we're, we're actually still taking um, participants if you'd like to sign up. Um, and we're just really excited to get this started and hope that it's a great experience for you. So CCL, you know, in addition to our work on climate change, we're a really strong community and we support each other. So um, in that spirit, our executive director has released this statement. Our staff, volunteers, and supporters are deeply saddened and angered by the most recent incidents of racist violence in America. Ahmad Arbery's murder while out for a jog in his Georgia neighborhood, the fatal shooting of Breonna Taylor in her Kentucky home, the threat of police violence against Christian Cooper in Central Park, and George Floyd's murder in Minnesota. We denounce these incidents themselves, as well as the chronic injustice that plagues America and harms communities of color every single day. CCL's mission is to build the political will for a livable world, but it's clear that for so many people of color, America is a far cry from livable. To our CCL volunteers who are black and people of color, no climate change is probably the furthest things from, from your mind right now. That's completely understandable and it's completely okay. I want you to know that you, your whole self are welcome in CCL. That means we know and respect that you're dealing with a lot right now, including structural barriers to your safety and well-being. Things shouldn't be this way, and I'm so sorry that they are. I also know that sorry isn't enough. It's not enough simply to list diversity as one of our values. The best way we can proclaim that Black Lives Matter to CCL and that we care deeply about your well-being and your safety and your happiness is for us to take concrete action. So we're taking this moment to educate the predominantly white members of our organization about recent events and what they can do to help. We are making plans to offer additional training to our volunteers on racism, privilege, bias, diversity in the environmental movement, and more, including in a special seminar at our upcoming virtual conference. We will continue to look for ways to do more and to do better. Like climate change, there is no simple fix for racism, but we will not shy away from doing our part in this vital work. Mark Reynolds, Executive Director of Citizens Climate Lobby. So if you're a person of color, um, we really hope you know that we support you and we stand with you. And as a community, we stand together. Um, and if you are a white person, we're also really glad that you're with us and that we have a lot of resources for you to be allies. Racial justice is integral to our work as climate activists. 
the two issues are, are very much related. Well, thank you so much, Claire, for grounding us tonight on a topic, obviously, that's clear and front and center in all of our minds as our country finds ways to respond forward. And with that, I know actually that uh, Dana and Peter have received some questions about that connection uh, that they're actually just going to start even tonight's um, AMA with. So I think that was really essential to ground ourselves with. And feel free to continue to put any thoughts or reactions that you have in the chat for everyone. Uh, but on that somber note, I do want to make sure to introduce our esteemed guest tonight, Dr. Peter Kalmus is a climate scientist, activist, and author from Altadena, California, who works at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory using satellite data and models to study clouds and ecosystems under global heating. He's the recipient of NASA's Early Career Achievement Medal and has over 100 peer-reviewed scientific publications. Previously an astrophysicist, he holds a PhD in physics from Columbia and a bachelor's in physics from Harvard. He lives on a tenth of the fossil fuels of the U.S. average and finds this life makes life more satisfying, not less. He's the author of the award-winning book, Be the Change, Live Well, and Spark a Climate Resolution, uh, Revolution, which includes a chapter on carbon fee and dividend, as well as numerous articles. And he's also on Twitter at Climate Human. So let me put a link to that as well as his book, which will feature in the chat. And with that, I also wanted to make sure to introduce our esteemed Science Policy Network lead, Dana Nucatelli, is an environmental scientist, climate journalist, and author of Climatology versus Pseudoscience. He's published 10 papers related to climate change in peer-reviewed journals, including three studies on the expert climate consensus. He's written about climate science for Skeptical Science since 2010, The Guardian since 2013, and for Yale Climate Connections since 2018. So it is such an honor to have both of you on tonight's AMA for our Climate Science Policy Network quarterly call and for our core volunteer training call. It's great to have all of these combined. And before I pass it to you, Dana, to moderate, I'll just highlight again and put a plug in for anyone that's interested. Uh, Peter's book is available for free at that link that I just put in the chat. It's inspirational. It's full of practical actions all of us can take on a personal and a policy societal level. And I do really recommend if anyone's curious after tonight, checking it out uh, to visit that link. So with that, again, thank you all so much for joining us. And Dana, the floor is yours to moderate our AMA tonight with Peter. Great. Thanks, Brett. Um, and, and thanks, Clara. That was actually a really good introduction because I wanted to tackle the, the issues of the protests and uh, environmental and racial justice to, to start off our discussion, too. Um, so, I mean, I know there was a lot of critiques of environmental groups and, and leading environmental voices for taking a while to say anything about the protests, but there have been a lot of good statements in recent days. Um, so, Peter, I saw you had a couple of Twitter, a couple of tweets about uh, the things issues of racial justice and environmental justice, and I was wondering if you just wanted to kind of weigh in on those issues and say whatever you wanted to say about it. Sure. I'll t I mean, my thinking is still evolving a lot as all of ours is, I think, but I was, um, you know, I've been over the last, I don't know how many years we, we keep seeing these videos of horrible violence um, perpetrated, especially against black people. And um, this one, I mean, this one just was, was awful. And uh, when we all felt it, um, and it, it did really get a lot of us thinking about the connections to uh, between racial justice and climate justice. Um, I remember my, going to my first um, regional conference for CCL. I don't even remember what year it was. It was maybe like 10 years ago. I, don't, I think at the time we didn't, no one really saw how to bring, um, to make our, you know, cli the climate movement more inclusive. And um, I think uh, Naomi Klein has really sort of trailblazed that. Um, and it's it's clear to me now that the thing to do is to to put climate justice front and center, and um, you know to make to, to sort of to really make the the connections between race justice and climate justice really clear. So so for example, um, one of the tweets that Dana that you just mentioned, um, it to me it's really striking that um, the the root cause of both. Um, uh, climate violence and race violence is, is exactly the same. It's um, the colonization um, and extraction of wealth um, that, you know, basically the, that's, that's been the, the European tradition for the last four or 500 years 
um, or even longer, actually, if you go back in history. Um, so, so we have this, there's this sense of, in, in this particular culture, sort of Western European culture, you could call it, which is, is the culture we have dominating in the United States now. There's this, this, I, this sense, right, manifest destiny, right, American exceptionalism, that, um, that people in this culture can go out and take whatever they want um, and, you know, commit genocide and enslave races um, to, um, for the sake of profit, right? Or, or similarly to go extract fossil fuel um, and burn it for the sake of profit, uh, even though that, you know, there's, this is causing irreversible um, and profoundly serious damage to our planet's life support system um, that, you know, we are already feeling, that our children will feel, be feeling, their children will be feeling, that non-humans are feeling, right? So it goes even beyond this one species. Um, and it, th this suffering is, is clearly visited um, upon uh, marginal communities and especially communities of color by far the most, right? In the global South and also right here in America um, where um, you know, there's numerous studies showing how communities of color are facing far greater health risk from um, sort of climate breakdowns uh, evil sibling, which is um, air pollution, right? And so, so particulate ma matter, ozone. So all of this, this what we think of as urban smog and air pollution, which is um, caused by burning fossil fuel primarily, affects people of, of color the most, much much more than sort of more affluent um, uh, white communities. Um, and and you know should make it clear by the way that um, you know there's also. A, a, sort of economic justice issues wrapped inextricably into this, right? Um, both in terms of uh, international justice, you know, United States versus the global South, which is, which is why, um, you know, we, we, can't, we can't talk about climate breakdown without talking about climate justice. But then again, here in the United States, where the average white household has 10 times the wealth of the average black household, which um, it, to me is, that's a profound, and, and very um, sh shocking and demoralizing statistic, which, which you know, along with other statistics like incarceration, just shows how um, how grossly unequal the systems that we've created in this country, or or that have that that have evolved in this country over hundreds of years, um, and have have kind of been set up to basically ensure that wealthy white people um, continue to have. Uh, you know, the lion's share of the power and the lion's share of the money, right? So you can all already see how deeply entwined this is with, um, you know, r racial and climate justice together, right? We're fighting against um, this consolidation of power and wealth by the fossil fuel industry and the people that control the fossil fuel industry and the people that are lobbied by the fossil fuel industry. So, so it's all connected. And then um, one thing that really strikes me is um, uh, Ibram Kendi's, I don't know if you guys have read his, his amazing book called How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, you know, being non-racist just clearly isn't good enough anymore. Um, we're all called, whether, no matter what our uh, race is, we're all called to be anti-racists. That's the antidote to racism, which means that we're not neutral, but we're profoundly active in our support for anti-racist policies um, and you know, support for kind of anti-racism in our communities. So that means that whenever we see racism, we actively push back against it. It's not good enough just to, to pat ourselves on the back and say that we're not racist. And then um, I, I was just struck by how that's exactly analogous to, uh, to, to the burning of fossil fuels. So I, I think that we should all be anti-fossil fuel now um, at every scale and kind of in every moment of our lives as much as we can and push back against these norms that it's the prevailing norm that it's okay to burn fossil fuel, whether that's a, a university that, that refuses to divest or you know, people, uh, the norm that it's okay to fly around a lot and burn a lot of fossil fuel um, or the, you know, the norm that it's okay at NPR to have advertisements for fossil fuel corporations, for example. So all, there's, there's a million ways in which these norms are still say that it's okay. And if we're neutral to that, if we don't actively push back against that, 
then we're part of the problem. So those are my, I, that was kind of a rambling, th those are my initial thoughts. Yeah, no, that was, that was really well said. Thanks, thanks, Peter. That was very, very good. Um, I actually wanted to kind of connect that with a little segue to our, to our second topic that I want to talk about, um, because so one key aspect of climate and uh, environmental justice is that a lot of minority communities are located near fossil fuel power plants, and so they get all the local air pollution associated with that. And so, as you said, it's really important to phase out those fossil fuels as quickly as possible. And so then we recently had this uh, film come out uh, on YouTube by Jeff Gibbs and Michael Moore, uh, Planet of the Humans, something like 8 million views uh, on YouTube. And it basically, so there's basically two key points that I kind of wanted to touch on from the film. Uh, the first was kind of its strong attacks on renewable energy as not being any better solar and wind not being any better than fossil fuel energy. And then, so a lot of people made critiques of those points, um, which we can talk about. And it's kind of the second angle that there was a lot of kind of pushback was that, I guess people thought that the main point of the film was that we need to address growth uh, one way or another. It didn't really uh, go into very much depth about how we should do that or even define what it meant by growth. But like that is kind of a key point that I think it's worth talking about. Um, so, um, if you'd like to kind of go into either of those two uh, directions, uh, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about that too. I did watch the film, uh, I think the same day it came out, and um, originally, like right after I finished watching it, it didn't help that it was like super late at night. Sometimes I have a hard time uh, kind of going to sleep and, you know, kind of turn on the Netflix, and that was one of those nights. But anyway, um, you know, there, there, it's... It's no matter what we do, I think at this point, whether we're scientists or documentary filmmakers or um, you know, lawyers or artists or teachers or um, you know, doctors, no matter what we're doing now, in this um, epoch of, of misinformation, which is coming from the very top of, of our society, um, from our elected leaders, and has, has really done so much damage and is, uh, has the, this really broad, strong um, mouthpiece in the form of social media. We, we have a responsibility to cleave as closely as we possibly can to facts. Um, and, you know, the, the, the planet of the humans really reminds me of, um, in some ways, of Cowspiracy, which was another, like, really uh, influential documentary, which came out, I don't know, uh, maybe almost 10 years ago now, five to 10 years ago. And it's the whole, that whole documentary was centered around this idea that um, animal agriculture is responsible for over half of climate breakdown, which is just plain wrong. It's, it's based on junk science. I read the paper, which, which uh, kind of made that claim, which was just so full of completely incorrect stuff. It was just embarrassing. The correct number is closer to about 15%, which is still huge. And you should still have a documentary about animal agriculture and the benefits of veganism with the 15% of our climate catastrophe being caused by animal agriculture. And all of the other issues with animal agriculture, like contributing to um, zoonotic pandemics and antibiotic resistance, um, you know, and, and pollution of our water system, et cetera, et cetera. It just, it goes on and on. It's a, the health issues involved, right, to, to us, um, if not to the animals. So you can make a perfectly good um, documentary with correct facts. And I think the same thing is true here. Um, I think it was, Planet of the Humans was, was trying to make some valid points. It was, it was trying to, um, to increase our sense of urgency around uh, climate chaos and climate breakdown, which is an admirable thing to do. I, my own theory of change says that one of the biggest things holding us back right now as a society for kind of addressing this collectively is that far too few of us, and probably I think if we're on this call, we, we get that this is an emergency. And if we're climate activists at some level, we get that we're in a climate emergency, but we're still just a tiny fraction of the population. So it needs to be mainstreamed and we need to get a much bigger fraction of the population to realize in, in their gut, not just intellectually, but, but in their emotional intelligence, that this is an emergency. So it was trying to do that. Um, and it, I think it was also making some points which are often swept under the rug, which is that 
um, green energy, renewable energy, in, in my opinion, is great. Like the documentary didn't say that, but that we also need demand reduction, which the documentary did say, and which I agree with. So it's a shame that those two good messages were basically completely overwhelmed by the fact the many factual inaccuracies in the documentary. And my question is just why? Like if you can if you can interview, you can choose who you interview, you can find their credentials, you can stick to peer-reviewed science, you can do a very you can do your homework basically and, and make the same documentary, but with hundred percent as or as close as possible as you can get to completely accurate information. And I just don't know why you wouldn't do that. And so obviously, you know, this hit like a meteor and and created even more chaos in the kind of the the nation burgeoning climate justice movement, which is sort of, you know, I, I would say it's kind of the last thing we need, but I, I think it did in some sense, it caused confusion, which is bad. It also led to a lot of good discussion, which is a good thing. So I don't, it's not clear to me if it was a, if because of that good discussion, if it was a net positive or a net negative. So Dana, do you have any additional thoughts? Yeah, that's a good question, whether it's going to do more harm or more more good. Probably more harm, I would guess, because of the amount of misinformation about it. I think that's my sense, too. It, you know, it's it misinf like conspiracy is still like it's still just echoing through uh, the discussion, this this fit, this 51 percent number, which is just outrageously wrong. And and when I push back against it, First of all, it's like, it's a distraction for me. It's not what I want to be talking about. I want to be talking about the solutions, not about whether it's 51% or 15%. Um, and then it creates this kind of confrontational um, sort of relationship between the, the people I'm talking to who are fans of the film and want to defend that incorrect number. So it, it's just, um, it's just, it, yeah misinformation from whether it's well-meaning, whether it's coming from the left or coming from the right, whether it's intentional or unintentional, um, always does a lot of damage. Yeah, and my other big problem with it was the specific misinformation, misinformation was about like wind and solar energy, which is like, mm -hmm. like the power sector is like the one sector of the economy that actually had some success with reducing the greenhouse gas emissions from like transportation's been flat, buildings been flat, industry's flat, like everything else is like we're not making in, in the United States, we're not making any progress in reducing emissions, but the power sector in the, in the United States, we're actually reducing emissions because we're installing all this wind and solar and some to some degree natural gas too. And so like that's like the one area that we're having success and like that was the area that this film like honed in on and attacked and made it seem like like it was you know, no better than burning fossil fuels, which like we should be trying to do like decarbonize the, the grid as much as possible and then electrifying other sectors so that we can get the emissions from other sectors down by kind of coupling them to the low emissions from solar and from wind. And so it's, it's not just that it's that, that had misinformation in the film, it's that the misinformation was targeted at like one of the most critical sectors and success stories that we've had in the kind of climate environmental movement or the, the movement to reduce emissions and address climate change. So that was my main frustration with the film. And I'm actually in the chat, I'm gonna put a link to my um, article about the film at YaleClimateConnections.org. Um, so, and I, I liked your comparison to Cowspiracy, which I also uh, did a deep mucking of probably five years ago now, something like that, because it's the same thing. It's like, there is like an important point to be made there but it makes it in such an inaccurate way that it just misinforms people and just confuses the discussion. Um, and so like in this film, they did have, a, there was a, a valuable issue that should be in, you know, investigated in terms of like how much bad or how much good it's doing in, in the, in this wood biomass burning. Like it spent half hour talking about wood biomass burning trees for energy. And so, you know, it kind of did a very qualitative look at this and kind of just, kind of an emotional like burning trees is bad but there wasn't any really investigative look at like you know is this being done in a sustainable way or not it's just like so it was you know that would be a worthwhile documentary would be to investigate wood biomass burning uh in a, like a, a thorough and qualitative way but it didn't do that and that also frustrated me um yeah and then there, like there's one other big issue which was the uh the, the hit job on Bill McKibben which I don't yeah. think helped anything yeah. Um, I mean, and that, and that leads to a much larger discussion, which is how do we grow a movement and how do we be allies to each other, even when we disagree on not only on tactics at times, but also on strategies. Um, and 
disagreement on strategy. We look, we we all have the same goal, right? We want to we want to reduce our emissions down to zero as quickly as possible and save what's left of our climate system, of our ecological systems, and of our civilizational systems. We, we share that goal. Um, just what if if we are working towards that goal with integrity? And I don't think I I've I've known Bill's work for a long time, and I've never I, I couldn't imagine anyone questioning his integrity, which is exactly what the film did. But so long as we're working toward that goal with integrity, um, in my view, it's actually a good thing if we have uh, discussion and disagreement about strategy and tactics, because the problem with strategy and tactics is you, they, you can feel that your idea of what the correct strategy is, is, is right and everyone else is wrong and they're idiots. The thing is, you can never know that for sure. It's just too big and complicated and multifaceted to ever be sure that your preferred strategy is the right one. Um, so we should all be have a little bit of humility and be willing to um, to accept that you know other people might have different strategies that feed into the broader movement and are helpful in their own ways, even if we disagree with them. Um, and I don't think that that bashing tried and true allies. Uh, you know, we, we can disagree with some things that Bill says respectfully, but I don't think there's anything to be gained by bashing him in that way, especially if you're doing it by, you know, taking video clips out of context or catching him, you know, when he's, you know, distracted, for example, and then focusing on those clips. So that, that really bugged me. Yeah, that was, that was really bad. Um, at one point I did want to touch on too was that, you know, in, you know, in response to my article, I got a lot of pushback about people saying, well, you're not addressing the key point in the film is growth. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the problem is you have to be careful about when you talk about growth, what you're talking about, because there was a lot in the film about people talking about overpopulation being the problem, which that's a really sensitive topic because most population growth is happening in developing countries that the people there have small individual footprints, carbon footprints. And so like population growth itself isn't so much of a problem, it's, but there is another growth problem in terms of consumption growth, like the amount that we consume and that's increasing at a much faster rate than population growth. And that's more of a problem for us developed countries. Um, and so that is a worthwhile thing to look at. But again, that's not what the film did. The film just kind of said growth is bad. It talked about overpopulation, which is not really so much of an issue. And, and I just thought, it, that was handled really poorly and it could have been like if they wanted to look at consumption growth like working over consumption like that would have been a worthwhile thing to look at but again they didn't do that in the film yeah um consumption is the bigger issue and there's data behind that um in my book i kind of made this claim that it was uh, about 50 percent um population growth and 50 percent uh, uh consumption growth but i think that was incorrect or at least that's changed since i was doing that research and it's it's more skewed towards the growth in consumption is what's driving the growth in our emissions even more than population growth. You have to understand that here in the US, we're, we're using every year per capita, per person, uh, almost 20 um, metric tons of CO2 equivalents per year. Um, so that, that includes CO2 and methane and uh, nitrous oxide and sort of all of our climate impact rolled into one. Um, in Europe, they're, the per capita, they're well under 10. They're, you know, France, Germany, they're somewhere in the seven or eight metric ton range. So they're already using half, half of, of the, the energy or the, the climate sort of budget, what's left, the carbon budget, than, than we are. Um, and they're living high on the hog still, I think, uh, kind of speaking from a global perspective. And then you have, you know, the average person in you know, your average developing country like Bangladesh, they're using about one metric ton uh, CO2 equivalent per year. The global average is like around four or five metric tons, which I feel right now, that's a pretty good goal for us to be shooting for. Um, so this is, a, this is a much, much bigger discussion. So, so I got mine down to about two. Um, and you, know, you have to be very careful um, about how you frame this because going from 20 to two, that's 18 metric tons per year. And we're, we're emitting as a, as a global society about 40 billion um, metric tons of CO2 per year globally. So that's, it's, you can't get too happy about your reduction from, from 20 to two. But the, the thing that I think is important about that journey is to, to you know, what you learn um, 
these are the friends that you make along the way, but it's also how you discover how just how, um, how joyful it actually is to live with less fossil fuel, which is actually the whole reason I wrote my book was because no one was saying that. No one, everyone was being like, oh my God, we can't you know, reduce our flying. We can't reduce our meat intake. It's, we can't start biking more. Um, it's gonna be you know, horrible and it's gonna be sacrifice. And that isn't my experience. And a lot of people who kind of do that, it's also not their experience. You can live a perfectly good life at the, uh, the global mean, which is about five metric tons per year. And you can go even lower than that. And then the really interesting thing here is that once you start going down, you know, and it's, it's not hard to kind of figure out where your own emissions are coming from, you quickly realize how much the systems have to change to allow you to go further. So once you get down to the five tons per year, the two tons per year level, um, you start to realize that you would have to basically become obsessive to go further than that. Um, and I, I, in my own life, I kind of feel like in a lot of ways that would be counterproductive because then it'd be a lot easier to just, to just kind of, re you know, ignore what I'm saying and say he's just a nutcase who is obsessed with reducing his own individual footprint. Um, instead, you know, you can start really saying like, like, well, that, that last, those last few tons, they're so deeply embedded in the food system and they're so deeply embedded in uh, our transportation system and our industrial system. Um, our energy system that you you the the places that we have to change systemically just start like you know glowing in neon right and and um, that it's really useful I think to have that to see to to experience that not not just to read about it in an article but to experience like yeah how how hard it is to get completely away from natural gas if you heat your house with it and you cook with it and you know you heat your hot water with it it's really you know those fixing those things are quite costly um you know and so then we were right back to the climate justice aspect of things right so and the and the and the wealth inequality so so all of these you know it's, it's a, just a to me it's been a joyful and a worthwhile thing um i know we kind of i walked really far away from from population um you know i i i think you could make a very good documentary on population and how it's related to climate justice. Um, and it would focus a lot on um, uh, uh, empowering women globally, especially in the global south, uh, educating women, um, allowing them to have more control over their reproductive decisions, um, allowing, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, contraception to be um, freely available to them, which would be like, such a cheap way, in my opinion, to start addressing the population part of the equation. Um, so, and, and then, you know, I, I think that another interesting dynamic here that I don't see a lot of people talking about is that um, the, the up and coming generation, the, pe the people right now, right here in the US, um, is, you know, especially, you know, the people that are um, kind of have more privilege, more education, I um, mean, I think this is probably happening happening globally. Um, there's a lot of concern about you know whether or not um, they want to even bring new new human beings into this world with um, you know climate breakdown looming on the horizon. So I I think that um, it wouldn't surprise me at all as that as the the climate emergency awareness starts to percolate through all walks of life and through all nations, um, that could have a profound effect on. Um, on the global um, birth rate, uh, which which probably isn't captured in um, United Nations projections yet. So I, I, that's pure speculation on my part, but it's going. I, I think it's going to be interesting to see if um, there's a dynamic there that just like people are like you know, you know, it almost becomes self-correcting, and and as more, maybe this is part of why I, I you know another reason why I think it's so important for us to just really as activists really broadcast as much as we can, just what an emergency this actually is. Okay, so I think we should move on to some of our poll everywhere questions. Um, and one of them is connected to COVID, which I thought we should talk about, so. So Dana, why don't you moderate and I'll do my best. Um, everyone, please be kind because I haven't seen these questions ahead of time. So I'll do my best and I'll try to keep it a little shorter too so we can get some more questions. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, first one's really simple. What are the connections between climate change and COVID? Oh uh, yeah, that's that's a 
great question. It's, uh, I think it's still evolving a lot. Um, I don't really consider myself an expert. The, the latest um, uh, number that I saw, so it was originally 6% reduction from the lockdown rate, and then it was up to 8%, and uh, then 12%, and has, it's gone up to 17%, right? That was the most recent figure that um, there's an annual, like from this time last year, um, globally emissions are down 17% because of COVID. And that was a few weeks ago, so it might have changed. And I think people are starting to move around now, which um, in my opinion is probably too early for that. But um, um, so the, 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 my main takeaway from this is that once, we, and you'll, you'll sense, start sensing a theme here, once we um, recognize collectively uh, that we're, we're facing an emergency. And once we feel, again, not in an intellectual sense, but we actually feel that our lives might be at risk. Our livelihoods, our lives, our children's lives might be at risk, which is what happened with COVID. Um, norms change literally overnight. Um, to me, that's a, an incredibly uh, so, a source of huge optimism to me about the climate emergency. Um, you know, it's, it's very, very, it seems very, very hard to convince most people that aren't already convinced that this is an emergency. Um, but, it, you know, over the last two years, and, and you know, I, I think a huge part of the um, huge influx in energy over the last 18 months or two years within the climate movement has been because of climate justice and, and causing, this is to go back to the first question, and, and causing the, the movement becoming more inclusive and including more um, communities of color and uh, marginalized, marginalized people. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we are seeing um, uh, a, a huge increase in the um, this, this sense that the, uh, that the mainstream, that the public has, um, that this is an emergency. You know, it's, it's gone in the course of a couple of years from the, being one of the bottom issues among voters in the US to, to very close to one of the top issues, um, which is remarkable uh, in, in a very short amount of time. And once, once we get hit this critical mass, and I don't know what, what that is in terms of fraction of the population, but I think the norm's gonna change more rapidly, possibly more rapidly than we um, can then we think it will now like we as as CCLers you know we've been banging our a lot of us have been banging our heads against um, climate policy for such a long time and it's felt like such a uh, such a hopeless task right with a with this very you know deadlocked um, political situation that we have in this country um, I think the thing that's going to unlock it is really going to be um, the public just demanding emergency action on climate um, and the norm shifting and, you know, fossil fuel becoming, you know, not welcome anymore. And um, people that burn a lot of fossil fuel getting like significant social pushback because the license, you know, right now, I think when you burn a lot of fossil fuel, it's like lifestyles of the rich and famous and you get a lot of Instagram followers and you post your, your fancy, you know, vacation, your high flying lifestyle. So right now, the social norms pointing in the opposite direction. And but I think that could, that could shift quite quickly. Um, that's my biggest takeaway from COVID is, is how quickly norms can shift. And then of course, there's the, the very direct um, sort of that 17% of emissions reduction, um, how a lot of us in dirty cities like Los Angeles, where I live, are realizing how nice it is, how genuinely, how you can really tell with your body when the air pollution is down. Um, and so I think a lot of people experience that. Um, here we had kind of like a perfectly good storm of like, remarkable late rain, which came right at the same time as the uh, um, the emissions reduction here in the Los Angeles basin. So, so we had we had cleaner air here, or a longer and cleaner run of clean air than we've had in decades, I think. And you could really sense it with your body. So so hopefully it, this is like a, the, a really big kick. And um, the question now as activists is how can we What's, what are the strategies and tactics we can use to um, try to usher in a green transition out of COVID um, and, and tr to try to kind of, you know, to, to, to make this into as big of a teachable moment as we can that, you know, you know maybe business as usual wasn't really making us all that happy, um, that we're addicted to growth 
um, which is a big problem, right? Like as soon as you, you, you turn off the economic system, which is sort of, in my opinion, um, see there's a question about demand reduction there. Uh, so we, we kind of have to turn off business as usual somehow and go to a steady state or non-growing economic system, right? So, so now I think like we, it's a lot more clear how, how hard that is and how this economic system is sort of addicted. Um, it's like this engine that keeps, it's literally an engine that runs on fossil fuel and is destroying the planet, right? So, so it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be really interesting how over the next few months and years um, that plays out. And I really hope it's not just a, a mindless um, return to business as usual as quickly as possible. So um, I think it's our job as activists to try to kind of usher that process um, in terms of the, the discourse that we have. And it's not totally clear to me yet how to do that. Yeah, another key connection too is that uh, pollution, the air pollution from fossil fuels seems to uh, give people, make them more susceptible to the mm -hmm. adverse health effects and death from coronavirus. So that's Absolutely. kind of motivation to reduce pollution so that we have better health outcomes. From it, it also interestingly makes people more uh, susceptible to uh, heat death too, which is gonna become a huge issue, issue in the global south as you know, humid heat um, uh, increases over the rest of the century. And, and that, the humid heat to me, um, this is kind of an aside personally, that's one of the things that keeps me up the, at night the most. I mean, that, sometimes I, I, that, that's the thing that I still get kind of panic attacks about. And I think it's because the way my own body works physiologically, like my body hates heat waves so much. I just get so irritable and I can't think at all. And I just can't, I could deal with the cold fine, but something about heat waves that just destroys me. And I, I, I don't know if that's part of why I ended up becoming a climate activist. All right, so let's move to the demand reduction question you were talking about. Um, so it's basically, would you agree that most climate policy proposals don't have provisions for demand reduction? Uh, and if so, what policies would you propose to get demand reduction? Uh, that's a great question. So I'm, I'm not um, well versed enough in all the various policies and packages of policies to, to really to weigh in, but, but I just, I don't feel like there's a lot of demand reduction in any of them. And I, I'm, I'm speculating that because um, we're not talking about it very much. We don't talk about demand reduction. One, one fact that I like to, um, to put out there, which uh, there was a chapter in, in Being the Change, which didn't make it into the book, which was looking at uh, wind energy and solar energy and nuclear energy and how, how much of each we would need to kind of to, to go 100% you know, um, uh, carbon free in terms of our electric system here in the US you know, and how much wind you would need if you did that by itself, solar by itself, et cetera, what the footprint. So I, I looked at all of that data. And one of the fascinating things to me was that, um, you know, we already, some, some fraction of our electricity in the United States is already carbon free. And that's coming from nu mainly nuclear and hydro. And now also like six or 7% wind and a couple of percent from solar. Um, so it all adds up to something like 20-ish, 25-ish percent. I can't remember the exact number. Yeah. And so we, we, we have like this, we're using this much energy. This, this, imagine this is a bar chart, okay? This, this much is already carbon free. If we cut our electricity to usage, our consumption in half, so we went from here to here, then suddenly we have this much left instead of this much left that we have to decarbonize. And we have to build out renewables and storage only a quarter as much. So if we cut our, our electricity usage in half, uh, which, which I think is not completely unfeasible when you look at, at Europe, when you look at a lot of other nations, and when you look at just how much is wasted in our society here. Um, so, you know, you could, the, the policies are kind of boring that you can imagine that would help cause that to happen. Um, you know, efficiency standards would, would have to keep pushing them. You, we want to, so, uh, you know, roughly a quarter of, of our emissions is in the U.S. is caused by electricity. And then about, there's about a quarter more that you can, you can decarbonize by switching to renewable electricity. So it's not likely that we will cut our, our demand in half because we want to decarbonize that other sector. So we're going to add more in to our uh, like electrical push. But that, that, that cutting it in, in half, we into a quarter as much, that's, that's if like we just stayed where we are at now. Um, uh, 
but you know you want to you want to increase efficiency you want to have you want to frankly and, and i'm sorry to say this because i've been to so many you know pasadena city council meetings where we're talking about electricity and so i know how it's such a hot button topic for people who don't want to pay, pay like a tenth of a cent more per uh, kilowatt hour it's it's really remarkable to me how how they, they don't want to spend five dollars more per year on their electricity it's just i don't understand that mindset but we do have to make it more expensive and i think we should appreciate how just what an incredible boon electricity is like how can we take this stuff for granted imagine you, you know for for a while um i i got this like hand grind coffee grinder because you know in case there's a power outage and just kind of as like a fun thing and it takes a lot of work just to grind enough coffee for, for your morning coffee, right? And um, it takes a while, it takes several minutes to do it. So, and that's just one example. I mean, um, the electricity, what it gives us is incredible. And, and I think we should feel a huge amount of gratitude toward it. And I think if the people with the means to pay significantly more for it should be paying significantly more for it. So there's that climate justice issue again. And, and, and also, you know, we, I think it kind of goes without saying for this crowd, but there's an extremely strong correlation as you know, for CCLers, right? Since since if uh, you know we had a carbon fee and, and dividend, or what I like to call climate income, um, which is the same thing as a carbon fee and dividend, but if we had that, then you know seventy percent of of U.S. households would be better off, um, and they'd come out ahead with that dividend payment. And the reason for that is because rich people just burn so much more fossil fuel, right? And they should be paying, you know. Once you once you go into that tier of high usage, it's, electricity should just start getting much more expensive. Okay, let's go to the next my, question. My, my answers are too long. I'm, <laughs> You're I'm always saying I'm going to try to keep them short, and I, I just everything's so connected. You know, you start yeah. tugging on one idea, and it's just connected to every other idea. It's easier said than done. Yeah. Okay, so climate change disproportionately affects communities of color. How can we advocate to reduce the impacts on these communities, both in and out of politics? Well, you know, it's that's the kind of thing where there's, I don't think there's an easy answer. Um, uh, it's probably, so Dana, I hope you, you could pitch in once I make a mess of this answer. But, but I, I would, you know, one of the things I would say is, you know, first of all, I, I think personally that uh, you know Black Lives Matter is is a climate activist partner for us, um, and you know if you start going to to those events and supporting that movement, it's not a waste of your time at all, um, and and you know getting to know people in that in that movement. So that's sort of at the human level. Um, I, you know, I think that um, one one thing that would be really nice is as we start doing this, uh, having this Green New Deal and um, building out our renewable capacity, um, you know, solar plants at the kind of community scale are, are a lot more cost effective than putting solar panels on your own roof. You know, so we could put these over, um, you know, uh, the community center parking lots, for example. We, we could put um, community scale solar in like right smack in the middle of communities of color and create jobs there, for example, and, and cause these installations to benefit those communities the most. Um, and, and that would be highly symbolic, right? Because that, that would really, it's just so visible to see um, community scale solar and, and to see that going in. Um, so that's, that's kind of, that's one idea. Um, Dana, do you wanna add to that? Cause I, cause I know there's a million things we could say about this. Yeah, I mean, I would just say trying to work with uh, climate or environmental justice groups is really important, um, seeing what they need and, and how we can collaborate with them and work so that we're both achieving the goals that we're trying to achieve. Um, yeah. Another, I mean, you know, I think one of the things I really like about um, Marky and um, Ocasio-Cortez's uh, Green New Deal proposal, uh, which, which I, if you haven't read it, I urge you all to read it because it's only a few pages. Um, and obviously, it's just the it's just the barest outline of a plan, and and there would be, you know, volumes of policy that would actually be written and get implemented, and a lot of housing that would go on. But it's really useful to see what the outline is, and they've really done a great job of building in um, climate justice and um, frontline communities, just front and center, and in, into that policy package, the jobs package, um, et cetera. And I think that's 
I, I, I have to say that, um, you know, a few years ago, I was a little frustrated by the climate justice movement um, because I was like, it's all about emissions. We got it. The emissions are increasing exponentially and it's killing everything. It's killing the coral reefs. It's, you know, it's killing the global South. We just have to focus on emissions. And now I see it's, it's you know, I still think it's great to, to keep emissions, that, that global emissions curve, which is increasing exponentially, uh, to always keep that in the screen somewhere. But, but I, I think that it's absolutely correct to make um, frontline communities and climate justice and communities of color front and center in all of these discussions. Um, again, because that's, that's how we, that's the best way to build a, in my opinion, to build a, a vibrant climate movement, which is, the, is to me, that's the, that's, the only, that's the only way out of this is to make, is to, to get, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of climate activists to make it go everywhere, not just um, kind of the tr traditional CCL demographic. Um, and then the movement becomes supercharged and it becomes really powerful. And then we'll start getting policies and collective action and systems change. So, so I think um, strategically, personally, again, going back to these, these questions of strategy and tactics, I think it's high, highly strategically advantageous to, to, to very much um, emphasize these communities uh, in all of the, you know, to, to have them at the table and, and, and as we're writing these policies and discussing these policies to, to always keep them front and center. And um, those of us who aren't in those communities, I don't think we lose anything from that at all. So it's not a zero sum game. I think you actually uh, tackled a few of the questions uh, in that one answer, so that was great. Um, how about, are there documentaries that you, you, you would recommend that do accurately portray? <laughs> um, so it, <laughs> this is going to be a shameless plug. So when, when Brett actually showed the, uh, the, cover, the cover of my book at the, at the beginning of this, um, it wasn't actually the cover of my book. It was the cover of a little documentary that was made out of my book, which um, uh, I, I have so many, you know, let's politely say mixed feelings about Amazon, but it is streaming on Amazon Prime and it's got the same name. And it's, you know, I tried really hard to make it factually accurate. So it's called Being the Change, a new kind of documentary. So I encourage you to watch that. It's, um, it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit optimistic and you, you can tell it's definitely from a time before the race riots and the pandemic. And, um, you know, it's a, a time before we knew just how, how dark things were gonna get. Um, uh, with uh, this uh, administration, which reminds me, I should say, of, of course, I'm speaking on my own behalf here, um, not on behalf of NASA or JPL. Um, so, uh, gosh, I wish I had more ideas for documentaries. Um, uh, do you, Dana? I mean, yeah. um, what I liked, it was, it was actually like a PBS series uh, by Richard Alley called Earth, the Operator's Manual, which is based on a book that he wrote, I believe. Um, so I could kind of follow some really interesting uh, climate information. Um, and he's a, a, just an incredible communicator. And so it's really, really entertaining in, in addition to being really informative. Um, so yeah, I would, you can just probably Google Earth the Operator's Manual at PBS and it should probably pop up somewhere. And then there are the, the David Attenborough documentaries, right? Yeah. Which are, um, they're factually accurate and they're, they're emotionally accurate too. And um, you know, I think they're, that was an amazing service to humankind to make those. Okay, what's next? Uh, let's see, uh, let's do in terms of changing human behavior, the sacrifices we have to make, uh, what methods do you suggest to impose behavior change effectively? Uh, it's like taxes, for example. So what would, what would you, how would you suggest we get people to change their behavior? Um, right. So, so absolutely policy is, and you know, that the only way we can really change systems is by changing is by, is through policy, you know, and when you, when there's no gasoline for sale, because no one's driving gasoline cars anymore, that obviously no one's going to be buying and burning gasoline. So, so that's, that's the bottom line. But unfortunately, I, over my many years of being a climate activist, I've had far too many people be like, all we need is a carbon fee and dividend, or all we need is carbon rationing, both, both of which are good things. Um, but unfortunately, no one has a magic wand to just make those policies happen. So, so as, as we all know, as CCLers, um, this plays out in the, in the very messy arena of uh, partisan politics, um, you know, and, and money politics. 
and and it's a mess and we need and the you know the the, the forces arrayed against us uh, have a huge amount of money and a huge amount of power and they're not going to give it up voluntarily so the fossil fuel industry and the, the kind of rich people in charge right now who have benefited inordinately uh, from from petroculture and, and the fossil fuel sort of status quo in our economy um, so we we have the only way we can survive <laughs> um, on this planet is by creating a um, with anything that resembles uh, the kind of civilization that we all want to have. Um, the only, our only option is to make this movement uh, much, much, much stronger than it is um, as quickly as possible. So, so obviously when climate disasters keep coming and that's gonna keep pe more people, people will keep waking up just from the wildfires and the floods and the, the you know, increasing the volatility and uh, you know, increasing food prices, for example, um, hurricanes. Uh, the climate migrants, the um, authoritarianism and geopolitical destabilization, people will wake up and they will start to connect the dots. We have to accelerate that process as much as possible. And so that, that's actually weirdly to go back to earlier point why I, why I would advocate for people to, um, to, to talk about this every chance they get. Um, you know, don't, don't be shy. You know, talk about it at the, the supermarket checkout line. It's what I used to say before things got crazy. You can still do it, though. Uh, it's a little harder to get people's attention now. Um, and, and seriously consider reducing your own, taking reasonable steps to reduce your own emissions. Because I think that makes your voice more powerful. And it starts to shift that norm that I mentioned earlier, where right now it's not only OK to burn fossil fuel, but it's you're considered uh, it's considered desirable socially to burn a lot of fossil fuel. And we want to flip that on its head. And, and I don't see really a shortcut there, except uh, especially people with platforms. Um, I, I push really hard for climate leaders with, with relatively large platforms, very, very, very few of whom are, it's a pet peeve of mine because they're not doing it. They're not using less fossil fuel themselves. If, if some of these really big climate action celebrities um, you know, the usual suspects, if one of them was like, you know, I just, I got to give up my private jet because I can't stand it anymore. It feels too awful to be burning all that emissions when I know what it does. That would be such a powerful message in terms of shifting the culture. And those of us with, with smaller platforms, you know, it still helps, I think. And like I said before, it's actually not as horrible as you might think if you haven't started taking some of those steps. So uh, right, we're right about the end of the hour. How are we, how are we doing on time? Let's do... Is there hope for things to change when we can only seem to focus on one crisis at a time, like, for example, coronavirus? Um, the thing that gives me hope is this movement. That's the only thing that gives me hope, because like I said, it's the only path I see toward change, toward getting out of this. And I am starting to envision a movement that's so strong that carbon fee and dividend, you know, which for so many of us for so many years seemed like even that might be asking for too much, becomes like the barest minimum. And there's policy just like people, you know, policymakers tripping over themselves to, 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 to put in more and more aggressive policies. And we see that curve really start to go down and we see it start to cross national boundaries and nations, you know, sort of starting to compete with each other. Um, you know, based on trade and just based on what their people are saying, you know, and so almost like who can capture the green economy fastest and who can reduce their emissions the fastest. And once, once we really go off of this exponential increase and start to rapidly go down, um, I think the feeling of being a climate activist will be probably completely different. I mean, we'll still be grieving about the coral reefs and about the, the rainforests and about the boreal forests. Um, and about all the people losing their lives. And we'll be grieving for sure. But at the same time, I think we'll, we'll also have the sense that we're finally growing up as a species and that, that we can do it. And that um, we, we got very close to something very, very horrible and we lost a lot, but we're, but we're doing it. And I think, I think that's going to be amazing feeling. And that's, that's my hope. The, you know, it's, it's really important to, to watch out for false hope and guard against it. Don't don't just think that renewable energy is enough. Um, you know, we, we need all of the above, uh, and and what we really need is action. So 
So hope comes from when we act individually, when we, when we act with our friends, and when we see action you know, at all levels and, and the country actually kind of starting to enact policy. Um, that's what's going to make things feel really different. I don't think if we just, if the only thing we did was keep wrapping up renewables, um, I don't think, I think we, we, would, we would feel, start to feel more and more and more pessimistic um, as we, you know, more tipping points were passed and, and there was more flooding and more coastal cities, et cetera. So the thing that, the only thing that I think is going to counteract the darkness of what's coming, what's already locked in, is going to be the sense that like almost in a cosmic way, like we've, so we're starting to figure it out, both in terms of the justice side of things and in terms of how to live on this planet in a way that we can keep doing for uh, millennia to come. And then last one, since you're really good at this, um, can you give people a few tips for how to reduce their personal carbon footprints? <laughs> yeah, look at my book. It is available for free online. Um, so it, it goes into really gory detail. Um, the two biggest things that the typical uh, American can change is to fly less and to eat less meat. And you've heard that a million times, but it's really true. For me personally, as, as sort of like a fairly frequently flying uh, academic and academics fly a lot, um, wrapping down my flying was like three quarters of my own emissions, which was really shocking to me. Uh, and then food was like the second biggest thing. So basically just becoming a vegetarian and then becoming a vegan. And um, you know what, that was relatively easy for me too. Uh, I just, I took, I did a, an experiment for a month. I'm like, I'm just gonna try being vegetarian for a month and I, I liked it better. But then I'm like, uh, I'm gonna try being a vegan for a month and I didn't miss cheese pizza nearly as much as I thought I would. Um, so it just wasn't that bad and you do feel kind of lighter and every step that I've taken to, you know, I don't, I, it scares me to, to sound sort of, you know, a little bit like uh, self-righteous, but, Every, every time I've taken a step to align my, my personal actions with my overwhelming sense that this is a climate emergency, I just, I feel better. I feel lighter. I feel like, I, I feel a little more hope, I guess, you know, and that's irrational because I know my own changes aren't, there. there's such a tiny drop in this ocean, but it, it's like when you don't make those changes, it's like having a splinter in your brain that you just always know like, oh God, I should really eat less meat. So just do it. It's, it's, you, you'll feel lighter once you finally just like, yeah, all right, fine, I'm gonna just do it. Yeah, and diet's one I've been working on and like you could just do it incrementally, like start by eating less beef because beef has the biggest carbon footprint. You know, maybe transition to poultry and then start to eat less poultry and maybe more fish and then transition to more vegetarian options. And then you know, so gradually you kind of get there and like I'm getting, I'm basically like pescatarian right now. And it's like, I don't miss the beef or the chicken or anything like that at all. So, it, But it's, it's also, it, uh, you, you pr it's probably dangerous. I, I would uh, not advise having this discussion without also saying that, it's perfectly okay if you're a climate activist. We, we'd rather have you in the movement without reducing your personal emissions than have you not in the movement without reducing your personal emissions. So if you're not gonna reduce anyway, you might as well come in the movement. I think it's better to come in the movement and then start taking reasonable steps. You don't have to give up flying completely right away, but start flying less and then see, like, see take one step at a time and see if, it, see if you like it better and see if it makes your message, if you're giving a talk at the library or if you're you know, at your CCL meeting or wh whatever you're doing. Um, you know, I found I wouldn't have a platform at all really um, if I hadn't taken these steps to reduce my own emissions. Like that's, that's where my whole, like no one would, I wouldn't be here talking to you guys if it wasn't for that, to be honest. Um, so it has really, I, my message is thousands of times more powerful without exaggeration simply because I've taken these just common sense steps to reduce my emissions. That's what you're known for. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to say too how deeply grateful I am for all of you. Um, you know, we just, there, there's nothing more important. I, in my opinion, I don't think there's anything more important we can do with our time and with our lives right now than be being climate activists. And CCL has really, trailblaze that and I know when I was first becoming a climate activist you know it was so valuable for me to have a home in CCL so thanks for uh, for everything you guys do. Me too same here. The feeling is definitely mutual and it just is really empowering to sit back and listen and hear about the journey that you've been on Peter so 
We really appreciate you joining and taking the time to walk us through tonight. And thank you, Dana, for hosting these quarterly. We hope you all found it uh, useful and empowering. Uh, feel free to reach out, let us know. I know that I posted uh, Dana and Mai's email in the chat here. And uh, here's again a reminder for mine for any feedback to make these better. And just be safe out there. Keep up the great work building the movement that we need to and seeing the change that we need in this world. And let us know how we can be there as a resource and support and all ahead. Be well, my friends. Thanks.